Stanky Framps here with another wacky sound education lesson. Today is lesson number six, mixing. I was excited about dials and knobs, but now we actually get to use them to do some cool mixing. You get the build, the world of sound for the pleasure of the audience, and it's all up to you. What do I mean by mixing? That is a very philosophical question. Well, different people like things blended different ways. Mmm, I like this batter I'm blending. I like this shirt I'm wearing. I like the way the colors blend together. My wife does not. And I may like the way I've blended the music. And others may not. So being a sound guy is a tough job. It's all subjective. You can't please everybody. When mixing, the first consideration you have to think about is, are you just mixing for a person who's speaking at a microphone? as in a lecturer or an orator? Or are you mixing for a band, which maybe has multiple instruments, perhaps one or more vocalists? Those are two entirely different categories. Let's start with a single lecturer. It's the simplest. It's not really mixing. All you're trying to do is get clarity and quality out of that guy's voice or that gal's voice. There is, however, work for you to do in order to pull that off. It, deals completely with the volume and also the EQ. Every person's voice is different and so the purpose of the equalizer or the EQ is to allow you to adjust the tone of their voice so that it is clear as possible. Typically men's voices you want to take out some of the bass and maybe add some of the mid-range because their voices tend to be low and rumbly. Women oftentimes are a little high and squeaky and so sometimes you want to take a little bit of that edge off by removing some of the highs and adding again some of the mid-range. As far as volume, you have to do what I suggested in the last lecture. You have to walk around the room a bit and make sure that you've got enough volume so that everyone can hear clearly even in the far corners of the room. That's it for mixing for a single lecturer or an orator. Now for the band. That's an entirely different topic. In the case of a band, there are two further categories or considerations you have to take into account. First is whether there is no monitor at all and they're just using the house speakers to hear themselves or whether there is a monitor. Let's start with the case where there is no monitor and they're just using the house speakers to hear themselves. In that case, the first thing you want to do is try to get the placement of the speakers correct. So the house speakers preferably are behind them, or in other words, the performers are in front of the house speakers, so that as the house speakers project the sound, players themselves can hear themselves. If they are even with the house speakers or behind them, they'll have a very difficult time hearing themselves and producing good quality music. However, if there are monitors, just the opposite is true. You have the monitors that are sitting on the floor facing up at them, and that's the mix that they should hear. You don't really want them hearing the house. So try to bring the house speakers in front, even with them, or all the way in front of, of the stage or in front of where they're standing to perform. So we dealt with the placement of speakers for those two cases. The next thing to talk about is how you actually do the mixing for those two cases. To begin with, without the monitors, with no monitors, in both of these cases, let me just divide it into rehearsal time and live performance time. During the rehearsal, you have a lot more leeway to mess around with the sound and learn a lot about the sound and get it like you want than you do during the live performance. So during the rehearsal, be bold. Make lots of changes. Be aggressive. That's the time for you to discover how to get the best sound possible. So you're looking at a blank mixing board and you've never used one before. What do you do? Well, the first thing you do is you put the main house volume about halfway up or at 0 dB and then you adjust each of the individual channels to get the blend of sound that you think sounds good. What you're trying to do with that total house mix is make sure you've got pretty good range of movement in each of the individual channels to give you good control. It's that simple but it's not that simple because the next thing you want to do is you want to further improve on that. The way people talk about mixing sound is that you're painting a 3D auditory image in space. So typically you want a lead singer's voice up front 
and you want the accompanying singers back behind that voice so that you can really hear your lead voice well. You want drums to be there in the background. You want guitars to be maybe on the left and the right. You kind of paint this 3D picture. It's a lot easier done with a recording than it is in a room. Uh, when you try to do that in a room, the acoustics of the room cause the sounds to bounce all around and so you don't really get that good 3D image. If there's someone who's maybe not as good a singer, bring their volume down. Not everybody has to be up at the same volume. You don't have to hear everybody. Here's one of the ways you can be bold during rehearsal. What you want to do is you want to make sure you go through a checklist of every single instrument that is on the stage and every single vocalist and make sure you're hearing them clearly and correctly. So, one of the best ways of doing that is to take the volume on that individual channel, there's a guy playing the guitar, take that guitar really high to where you can hear it really clearly in the house. Once you do that, you go, okay, that's the guitar, you can back it back down into the mix. Do the same thing with each of the individual instruments and do the same thing with each of the individual vocalists. And that will really give you two things. It'll give you a sense of how strong their signal is and it will get your ears trained to what they sound like. Oh, that's Sally's voice. Oh, this is Jill's voice. And then you can mix them in accordingly to what you think in your judgment is the best quality sound. You do that aggressive checking during the rehearsal. Once the live performance starts, everything is to be very small and very subtle. So you can make changes, and they can be significant changes if you really think, oh, that piano is really loud, I need to bring that down. Bring it down slowly so that it's not an abrupt change for the audience, and they may not even be aware that you're doing it, but the quality of the sound improves. And finally, we've reached the category where we have a band and we have a monitor system as well as the house speakers. This is a typical permanent setup in most churches or venues or concerts that you're going to see and hopefully you'll get a chance to run the sound for some of these because this is kind of the most fun venue to work in. So there are monitors that are on the floor that are pointed up at the musicians and that's more or less what they're hearing. The house speakers are out in front of them. The first thing you do is you kind of get the house speakers kind of balanced like you would like with the individual inputs while they're playing and then the next thing you do is you work at least third or a half of the rehearsal you are working on getting the monitor speakers producing the sounds that the musicians like and that they can hear themselves really well with. The way you do that is from their very first song, you go up on stage and you listen to what the monitors are producing. There's a lead singer, you the sound guy are standing right here beside them where their head is and you're hearing what they're hearing out of the monitors. And you go, hmm, wow, that lead singer can't hear herself. She needs to come up a little bit. and wow, those drums are really banging out of those front monitors, that's not good. So you go back to your soundboard, you make some adjustments on the individual channels for the monitors, not really messing with the house, and you come back up to the stage and listen some more. So for at least the first two, three, four songs, you're going back and forth, trying to improve the monitor sound and going back and making adjustments. Also, while you're standing there on stage, you want to be sure and ask, especially the leader of the band, is the monitor mix okay for you? So you're already standing here listening, either in the middle of a song while she's singing, or when there is a break, you can say, is the monitor system okay for you? No, you know, Sally is so loud, I can't hear myself. And so you now have some feedback from those musicians. And that brings us to something called the volume wars. Jill, the lead singer, says, you know, I can't hear myself. Sally is so loud. So you go back and you turn up the lead singer. Then you're on stage a little later and Sally says, you know, the lead singer is killing me. I can't hear very well. Can you crank me up? So you crank up Sally and, and the guitarist says, you know, those vocalists, they are so loud. I can't hear my guitar. So you crank up his volume. One of the things you'll find out about musicians is they have big egos and they love to hear themselves. Well, that maybe isn't as generous as it could be. People need to hear themselves clearly in order to be able to sing well. So they, they like to hear their own volume pretty loud. It's natural for them to ask for more volume. The thing is, as the sound guy, you can't let, that, you can't let those monitors get so loud 
that they overwhelm the whole house. So here's a little secret I'm going to tell you about audio tech guys and gals. What you want to do is decrease the volume in the other instruments or other vocals that may be interfering from this person hearing themselves. The thing is that oftentimes with monitors you've got multiple monitors. So the singers are hearing one mix, the drummer is hearing another mix, the keyboard, keyboardist has their own monitor and is hearing their own mix. Everything that's on stage does not need to go into every monitor. That's another way of keeping the volume of the monitors down and keeping clarity in the monitors that are coming out that are producing the music. So because you've got different mixes in the different monitors, that's why the monitor system is an entirely different mix than what's out in the house. So once you get halfway through the rehearsal or through three or four songs and you're comfortable and musicians are hearing themselves really well, then you can go back and mess with the house all you want. They're hearing primarily all of their sound through the monitors and what you do to the house doesn't really affect them. And then you can mix the house to your own liking to make produce the best quality music that you believe there should be out there in the audience. That's all there is to mixing, but it's an art. It's subjective and it takes a lot of practice. So. To help you practice, I'm going to, we're going to listen to some examples of music and I'm going to show you uh, a live sound system at our church and our sound guy doing some of the behaviors that I described and also um, we're going to listen to a quality recording. This track ran a lot longer than I expected so what I've done is I've got my examples on yet another YouTube video. Be sure to tune in for 6A where we listen to some live music and we listen to some recorded music and I talk about the mix and how it all works. This is Stanky Framp signing off with another lesson in wacky sound education.